Good afternoon now. I've been wanting to launch this Global Women's Lecture Series for some time. My dear friend Nina Ansari here spoke at the conference a couple of years ago, you, you may remember, and she has appeared on our cover to cover author series a couple of times for First Jewels of Allah, The Untold Story of Women in Iran. Uh, Nina is an author, historian, and UN Global Women Champion for Innovation, and she directs our new Global Women's Lecture Series. She is also the author of Anonymous is a Woman, a Global Chronicle of Gender Inequality. There's no more perfect person to be the director of this series, and we are going to hear from women who are not going to be anonymous if they ever were. One is Kelly Curry, former US ambassador at large for global women's issues. Another is Zarifa Ghaffari, who is going to be here in person, but is joining us from Germany via Zoom. So this complex hybrid event will take place. You have papers on your uh, tables so that you and the live audience, and thank you for joining us from the online audience, you too can ask questions. Live paper, online chat box, and they'll be delivered to Nina, who will present them to Zarifa and Kelly. So without further ado, we're not just talking about women, we're talking about girls, and here's a video. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Kropp, and I am lucky enough to be the Deputy Director of Development at Girl Up. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Dr. Nina Ansari, for inviting Girl Up to address this wonderful group. Girl Up is an initiative of the United Nations Foundation and a global youth development movement. We, are, we provide a platform for young people to use their voices for meaningful change in their communities and work together to address SDG 5, gender equality. With more than 5,000 clubs in 130 countries and, and presence in all 50 US states, we've trained more than 95,000 change makers. You'll hear from two of them in a minute. Gender equality or gender equity is more than a timely turn of phrase. We have seen over and over that girls and women shoulder the burden of almost every global crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has reversed many girls and women's rights group gains, and we're seeing upticks in child marriage, additional care work at home, and struggling families who prioritize the education of boys. Recently in Afghanistan, we have a clear example will have the impact on women and girls is urgent and even threatening their physical safety. This compounded crisis was a catalyst for humanitarian efforts relief that support women and girls on the ground, led by UN partners, including UNHCR and, UN, UN, and UNICEF. And what we found as we were aggregating all the resources for our girl leaders, um, there was a, a big surge of youth-led community-based action that sprung up alongside us. Youth are always at the forefront of social change because they're living it. Girl Up trains youth in advocacy, organizing, storytelling, and our members are speaking up and working to advance equ equality for all. More than merely elevating youth voices, our ability to listen, learn, and act is crucial for a sustainable future. From this conference to last September's UNGA, to the recent COP26, the voices of youth are loudly calling for change and holding leaders accountable. There are some good signs, but yet so much more to be done. We are thrilled to see the Biden administration formally announce a national strategy on gender equity and equality, and excited that one of our own UN Foundation colleagues was nominated as ambassador at large um, for global women's issues at the Department of State. Partnering with our youth leaders, Girl Up is launching resources to support young activists, including mental health resources in 2022 and new curriculum to address gender-based violence. We must invest in girls and women because when girls rise, we all rise. But you don't wanna hear any more from me. You really wanna hear from two incredible Girl Up leaders, Kira Campbell and Annabel Rose. They are, they are the local co-chairs of the Coalition of Girl Up Clubs and they'd love to share their stories. Thank you. My name is Kira Campbell, and I'm the co-coalition leader of the DMD Coalition, a group of 80 Girl Up Clubs in the Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia Tri-State area. I first became involved with Girl Up when I was 13. It all started when I attended the 2016 Girl Up Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C. The girl that attended that conference was a shy, quiet, reserved version of the girl I am now. If someone had told 13-year-old Kira that I would be standing on this stage today, 
I wouldn't have believed you, partially because I was convinced that public speaking wasn't a skill I could grasp, and yet it is true. And largely and thanks to the experiences I've had and the skills I've learned of being a part of Girl Up. After my initial experience at the Girl Up Leadership Summit, I went back to my community and established a Girl Up Club at my middle school, then later at my high school as well. It was a challenge to establish both these clubs, especially because I was so young and passionate. I was told that I came off as too strong and that because I was just a teenager, my opinions didn't matter. Yet, but it wasn't in my nature to back down. So instead I became more passionate and became more articulate and I became stronger. I began to realize, recognize the stereotypes and problems that existed within my community. From teachers paying little attention to students' mental health, to women not being included in sports, to minorities being treated as outcasts and racist comments being normalized, all the way to students being repressed from questioning authority. And with this awareness came my ability to stand my ground better. I was able to convince both my middle and high school administrations to let me start Girl Up Clubs, even though it was a concept that was completely new to my school, and I mean completely, and even my community. Soon my involvement with Girl Up Clubs led me to become involved with the DMV Coalition, allowing me to lead a group of club leaders from across the tri-state area. The community I come from is one of the most affluent communities in the nation. And with being one of the most affluent communities in the nation comes the preconceived idea that issues like domestic violence and human trafficking only occur in far off developing nations. Yet I knew that if there are organizations that work to combat these issues in my community, that issues like human trafficking and domestic violence were still issues in my community. So I applied the skills I had learned through Girl Up to talk with organizations like Loudoun County's Public Schools Student Assistance Services, Loudoun Abused Women's Shelters, and the North, Northern Virginia Human Trafficking Initiative to see what has worked for them in the past. I ended up throwing together an informa information session run through my county's student assistant services that had over a thousand attendees. The information, information session was not, not only educated the community on how the issues affected our community, but how human trafficking is a global issue that disproportionately affects women and girls and developing countries. I was able to educate my community on what they could do to eventually end the global issue and how most communities around the world were hit harder than ours. Though this experience became, through this experience, it became evident to me that even th though as a community, we choose to suppress the idea that a global issue could be affecting us, we were still scared and wanted to be educated. I used the same ideologies that I had learned through this, these programs when educating my community on domestic violence. Showing that this, is, this was a global issue and gender-based violence disproportionately affects women around the world. I shared statistics, created social media posts, put resources in schools, counseling offices all throughout the county. But most of all, started the conversation about how global issues such as these affect each community in hopes that spreading awareness of a global issue might just help one girl. With the backing of Girl Up, I've been able to educate my community not only on human trafficking and domestic violence, but also start countywide campaigns on mental health and eating disorder prevention, rally for women's rights after the 2016 election, collect thousands of dollars worth of donations from my local abused women's shelter, allow for period products to be placed in school bathrooms, and collect items for refugees and migrants. Most importantly, I have been able to mentor the next generation of young girls that attend my school to stand up for their rights. I started my Girl Up Club at my middle school five years ago. And now as a senior in high school, I'm working with the girls that were able to be advanced because of the knowledge I learned and spread through Girl Up. They were empowered because of the movement I had started in my community. And they are now able to apply this knowledge to issues they are passionate about. Girl Up empowers girls to step up and advocate for issues that they care about. I've learned to stand up for what I believe in and advocate for marginalized communities, no matter how many authoritative, authoritative adults tell me no. And they say no a lot. I've learned to defy the stereotypes that are embedded in me and to question authority. Girl Up allows girls to have a community, global and community-based perspective on issues that girls face all around the world, allowing girls to be an advocate for issues that they witness firsthand. Girl Up has been able to empower girls like me, and with Girl Up, I wouldn't, without Girl Up, I wouldn't be the girl I am today. And with that, uh, I'm going to introduce my co-leader, Annabelle. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, my name is Annabelle Rose and I am the co-coalition leader of the Girl Up DMV Coalition. It is such an honor to be speaking with you today. 
Growing up with an immigrant mother, I was always cognizant of the global female experience, but a combination of age, education, and my eventual involvement with Girl Up opened my eyes to a desire to help as opposed to just learn, though the former cannot exist without the latter. Catalyzed by a cool new club I just joined, I began to really question why I had been privileged enough to receive a diverse and accessible education. And that transformed into a feeling of commitment towards giving all girls the same right and access to education that's been an unwavering presence in my life. A bit of a cliche, I know, but I've now been involved in with Girl Up for all of high school and I've been able to take part in an amazing network of, as we call it, movers, shakers, and change makers. One of the best things Girl Up offers is a community where ideals and motives are shared. There's so much support that you know you can accomplish even the loftiest of goals and be someone that inspires others just as they've inspired you. Now, this is a global women's lecture series with an emphasis on global. And as I was preparing my remarks, I was reflecting on my global facing mindset. And I realized it's just that, a mindset. I'm a high school senior and despite concrete things I've done and the international relationships I've built, I have a whole life of change ahead of me. I sincerely hope to someday help as many people as the women speaking here today have, but I believe staying educated and cultivating a genuine desire to help are the building blocks one needs to eventually achieve a high level of impact. Girl Up gives me that head start by focusing on pillars of community, advocacy, and inclusion, and encompasses so many programs and opportunities that young women of all backgrounds and situations can find a welcoming and liberating place to grow and thrive. I don't think approaching activism with an international perspective necessitates an immediate impact, especially when you're young. Instead, it's seemingly small things you do in your own community that build up to form a future thinking global influence. It's donating the proceeds of a weekend movie screening to the Malala Fund for Girls Education. It's hosting voter registration drives and volunteering at the polls to create pathways for legislation that give immigrants and refugees a chance to experience this country in the form they deserve. It's hosting a summit with civil rights attorneys, cognitive psychologists, diversity and equity consultants, and college presidents that encourage attendees to unabashedly chase their dreams in pursuit of making the world around them a better place for everyone. And I think that's the most fulfilling part of being a Girl Up leader. There's so many ways your work can spread to others. You see a direct impact on the communities you help. On a local scale, it's donating menstrual hygiene products to women's shelters in Baltimore to help survivors of domestic violence. Globally, it's building friendships with teen girls in Kenya through pen pal programs and traditional bracelet swaps. It's having access to diverse people and opportunities that help you to learn about issues you never knew existed, from sexism in the disabled community to the disproportionate effects of climate of climate change on women living in poverty. It's working with amazing women to elevate yourself to a position where your voice and your actions have genuine potential to improve the world around you. And most importantly, it's sharing goals of gender equality, equity, and true intersectionality with your community. It's seeing the future that you envision for yourself and your daughters and their daughters become a goal that's shared between you and those you have the privilege of working with. It can be so motivating to have role models encouraging you to pursue your goals and change the world. That's the power of an organization as committed to female empowerment as Girl Up is. Participants are given the opportunity to be their best selves by learning from those around them. Every girl deserves a chance to meet adults who have a genuine desire to hear what they have to say, and Girl Up provides me and so many others with chances to do that, including at events like today. Not that this is an intentional advertisement for Girl Up, but the ability to change the lives of others has truly changed my life. And that is the gift I hope to bestow on every person I lead or am led by or simply encounter. Before I wrap up, I wanna thank Dr. Ansari, a longtime partner and friend of Girl Up for including us in this event. We're so grateful for you and all your work. Thank you everyone. And now you can turn your attention to the screen for a brief video. Thank you. Just months ago, they were winning international competitions making a low-cost ventilator out of car parts in the pandemic. They've now had to flee their homes in Herat province, leaving with almost nothing and little time for goodbyes. When we came from Afghanistan, it was a most of our circumstance for us, and we left our family. I'm so sorry. No. Take your time. And it was so hard for us because um, our family there and um, and our country destroyed. Well, we really thought that we have to go because we didn't have any other choice because 
serving our country is just by edu getting educated. Qatar has evacuated hundreds of students in recent days, mostly girls. Many who say protecting their education is the reason they fled. Let's I put these issues right. directly to the Taliban. Rights. Women have fought hard for their rights in Afghanistan, but they're terrified of what life may look like under your rule and what they stand to lose. What do they stand to lose? They will lose nothing. Only they, they, if they had uh, no hijab, they will have a hijab. Should not impose uh, your uh, culture on us, or not we are imposing our culture on you. But this was the journey out of Kabul, captured nervously on a mobile phone by a group of female students. Now in Qatar, they're too worried for their families at home to be identified. They were born the year the Taliban fell. I left everything in Kabul, literally everything. All we think about is our families back home. The Taliban said they're going to protect women's rights. Did that not fill you with confidence to stay? Well, they are saying these things, but I know them. My family, the whole people know them, they, what they did 20 years ago and what they are doing right now. They are not letting uh, girls to work, to go to gyms, to like uh, have some sort of entertainment and other things. One day, these girls want to return home to help their country. But in this moment of crisis, Afghan girls are leaving everything to protect their education. Sally Lockwood, Sky News, Doha. Good afternoon. My name is Nina Ansari. I am the director of the World Affairs Councils of America Global Women's Lecture Series, featuring prominent women who share their experiences that speak to issues and challenges faced by women and girls in the global community. Huge thanks to Carol and to the lovely ladies from Girl Up, Kira and Annabelle, for their inspirational presentation and for everything that they do to make gender equality a reality for the global community at large. Um, special thanks to Bill Clifford, his team and council colleagues for launching this series and happy, happy 35th anniversary World Affairs Councils of America. To inaugurate the series, we are absolutely honored and thrilled to have with us Ambassador Kelly Curry and joining us virtually from Germany, the Honorable Zarifa Afari. Zarif, can we patch Zarifa in? Hi, Zarifa. Can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, I can audio hear you. for Zarifa. Okay, wonderful. Um, gender equality is without a doubt one of the most crucial challenges of our time. It is not only a fundamental human right, it is a moral and strategic imperative necessary for sustainable development. To remind that the beneficiaries of equality and equal rights and opportunities are not just women and girls, but also families, communities, societies, and nations. Yet to date, no country has achieved equality. In fact, currently, the global gender gap index stands at 68%. And with this rate, it is predicted it will take another 136 more years to achieve parity. Um, this is unfortunate. And while we have made tremendous progress, there has also been setback. In countries like my birthplace of Iran, where women made significant advancements they saw the majority of their rights revoked in the immediate aftermath of the 1979 Islamic Revolution. For over four decades, these courageous women have fought an uphill battle to regain their rights, at time paying a very high price for their peaceful activism. And more recently, with the fall of Kabul and the return of the Taliban to power in Afghanistan, Women and girls are facing an uncertain future and living in an altogether transformed world, a world in which girls in most areas have been banned from attending secondary schools, a world in which most women have been banned from entering the workforce, a world that has abolished the Ministry of Afghan Women's Affairs and replaced it with one 
promulgating virtue and preventing vices. Zarifa, welcome. Um, you were only nine years old when the Taliban were last in power. You grew up in a world which saw numerous freedoms and opportunities for women, for young girls such as yourself, opportunities that enabled you to become one of the first few mayors of Af female mayors of Afghanistan, not to mention one of the youngest female mayors of Afghanistan, an environment which allowed women to become public officials. In fact, back in July, 27% of the parliament were women, and uh, Afghanistan saw an increased amount of young women attend universities, 60% of Herat University students were women, and Afghanistan also saw the first cohort of female medical school graduates, as well as the establishment of an all-girls robotics team. Zarifa, you fled with your family back in August, fearing for your safety after having survived several assassination attempts. You are now living in exile. Uh, as a prominent public official, you are in, any, in many ways a powerful voice not to mention the soul and the conscience for so many women and girls, not to mention the people of Afghanistan. Through social media, you have voiced your heartbreak, your sorrow, your despair at having to leave your country. You have called out the Taliban, not only for depriving you of being in your country, but also for depriving you of the many opportunities you and so many women had gained. Thank you for being with us here today. I am sure that everyone in this room is anxious to hear your perspective, especially since recently you have expressed, rightfully so, your shock at the recent silence of the world with media coverage drastically reduced with voices previously echoing what was going on with people in your country having diminished. What is the one thing you would like to share with us and how, is, how can we as, the, as an international community come to help the people of Afghanistan, especially women and girls who are now facing um, dire consequences potentially given the Taliban and their draconian measures? Thank you, Thank you. Uh, so much, Dr. Negina and uh, Ambassador Kelly for having me here and good evening people one ladies and gentlemen in room uh first of all it's it's a great pleasure being here and with that i need i have to say that before our conversation i heard uh the, the, the series of these two young ladies in a high school and it really uh kind of you know touched my heart and i feel uh, kind of so uh touch with it and as well the same time i feel all stuff with my like you know i try to uh conclude everything with the realities of ha what's happening and now in my in my country for girls for ladies for women who they were also having the same dreams for their lives for their future and now they are betrayed they are being abandoned and they are not able to continue their dreams they are not able to fight nowadays seeing or watching a dream or uh, is is kind of crime for them so it's really uh with all the feeling of the proud that i feel for these two great ladies young ladies i i i really feels a bit a big pain in my heart because I was just thinking the same the moment they were speaking about their life series about those girls who I really was sometime one of them. So I, I wish uh, they at least these two young girls could succeed and empower empowering more women and girls in education level. Uh, actually, I, I also saw my homeland, Afghanistan, in public office, like thousands of Afghan women, women who are educated, women who want to and are able to make a difference, uh, women who contributed to making the future of all Afghans, men and women, children, a little better than everyday. 
with the help of the international community, yeah, uh, and efforts of Afghan brave people themselves, my generation of women uh, has come very close to fulfilling a dream, uh, freedom and self-determination. We managed to convince a great deal uh, of Afghans that we, the women of Afghanistan, we are not the enemies of our country, cultural or Islamic traditions. Throughout our history, women as mothers, daughters, sisters, colleagues, and sometimes commanders have contributed to the peace in our country, but throughout the history of Afghanistan from in the period of Shah to the Soviet occupation to the civil war and to the Taliban. Uh, it was always women adapting the situation. And right now, once again, we are looking uh, at an Arsene's future again. I do not want to enter any kind of blaming game here once again. Uh, but yeah, the mistakes that were made where we have once felt and where the international community failed us, the international community abandoned us, they breathed a nation, they betrayed a nation, humanity, and lives of millions of people. Anyways, not going deep with this, uh, but I'm sure there will be time uh, to answer, and it will come to answer all these arguing questions for everyone. And uh, today we have no choice uh, but to look ahead, and I hope the international community will not leave us alone with this difficult task. I am sure humans of the world, after at least seeing the cause of the Kabul airport in August 2020, and pictures of people fleeing down from the planes can be more human to humans of Afghanistan, in particular to women of my country. People in my country fear for their lives, and more ever women fear for their rights to exist as citizens. I hear the voices of my sisters, and I see their courage on the streets of Afghanistan every day, and how they have been beaten by and bettered by Taliban. I see my people struggling with poverty and hunger. I feel my Afghan mothers selling their daughters so they can feed the rest of their children. I share the pain of brave Afghan girls not going to universities and schools, but whatever uh, for now I can do, uh, is just to fight for them, uh, for my generation, and maybe the future generation of my country. And I, I will fight uh, with my vice, as I don't have a gun, but definitely I have this vice, and I will rise it so the world won't forget us the same way they did it in the 90s. Um, uh, back uh, in the history. And what about the such uh, what about uh, is uh, uh, international community is able to do for Afghan people now is first of all not recognizing Taliban before the the, the uh, guarantee of humanitarian rights in particular women rights. I am saying this because now now Taliban are reality on ground and. Uh, Definitely, there won't be 2001 and military uh, uh, support of international community to kick them out of this country once again. So they are there, but yeah, if we want to help Afghan people, is to pressure, pressurize Taliban, pressurize Pakistan, Pakistani ISI, Pakistani government to not feed tourism, to not feed tourists, and to stop interfering in my country. It's it's more than 60 years that it's happening and everyone is just watching around the world. And the one who is paying price is us, Afghan people in, uh, in the country. And the same time, to help Afghan people with humanitarian aids, not giving, when I say humanitarian aid, it doesn't mean to uh, giving uh, to give money or dollars to Taliban or their leadership, because there is no guarantee that leadership of Taliban will use this money once again 
for tourist activities around the country or maybe in the world. So uh, it will be uh, like so important to use all humanitarian organizations to uh, help people because winter is there. People are striving with poverty, hunger. There are like so many people jobless, people are dying, people are selling their children. So situation is so worse. This is something that the world can do. And uh, at the end, whatever I really want everyone around the world is to put pressure on their decision makers uh, to at least not play the same, whatever play have been played during 20 years or maybe in, 15 August 2020, uh, 2021 in Afghanistan. Uh, the policies that was made for Afghanistan from the starting to the end, it has so many pro uh, problems. And the one who paid the price for these problems and the mistakes of po policy makers and strategy makers, it, it was us. I know internationally, uh, people who were involved, they were also paying prices, lives, efforts, but uh, yeah, if we uh, if we kind of try to count who paid most, it's always our funds. So please, at least, not repeat the same uh, game and the same mistakes once again in Afghanistan. It's the more important topic. I have more questions for you, but I wanted to take um, take it to Kelly for a second. Ambassador Curry, first of all, we're honored to have you with us, given your illustrious career in foreign policy from having served as a U.S. ambassador at large for global women's issues, having held senior positions in the U.S. Department of State, the United States Congress as well, specializing in humanitarian issues, human rights, political reform, I can go on and on, women's economic empowerment, conflict resolution, um, and a conflict prevention. You have worked on these critical issues across our foreign policy and national security infrastructure, specifically as the principal ways we can help support women worldwide. You have additionally highlighted human rights violations in countless countries, um, specifically the violence, the dehumanization, the discrimination, and you have rightfully brought up the costs and the consequences of such behaviors, reinforcing that no society should be able to escape the consequences without repercussions, and I cannot agree with you more. Uh, which brings me to the following, and what Zarifa has just told us, and what we are all aware of is going, obviously the situation in Afghanistan is one that warrants serious con concern with the Taliban having fostered an atmosphere of impunity and fostered an atmosphere of pervasive fear, um, not to mention the multiplier effects of not only holding back the female population, but also the threat of extreme violence, right? The elevation of extremism. Kelly, given your expertise in this field and foreign policy specifically where humanitarian issues are concerned, what can be done by the global community to raise the cost of these behaviors uh, uh, specifically so that humanitarian issues are not overlooked by economics, geopolitical issues, and other issues that we, you know, as we've seen with the Iran nuclear deal, you know, you have the global community willing to engage with a regime that is known for its egregious human rights violations, but at the end of the day, that's not even a consideration when you're sitting at the negotiation table. So moving forward, how can we work to hold the Taliban accountable for their atrocities, specifically their draconian measures. Well, thank you, Nina, for that um, very generous and uh, overwhelming introduction. Um, I think that one thing that, that you said that I, I do want to unpack a little bit, which is that no society um, can flourish, no country on this planet can flourish if they repress, ignore, or and otherwise abuse half of their population, hold them back from fully participating in their economy, their political life, their society in general. I think that we've seen this over time. And then the inverse is true, that those countries that do repress women, that do um, 
put them at, at a disadvantage economically, politically, societally, um, tend to have serious problems that go beyond just the way that they treat women. And if you look around the world at the places where the United States is, faces conflict, faces challenges from violent extremism to um, nuclear uh, threats in North Korea to other, to other um, areas where the United States faces challenges and national security threats, a common thread across all of these contexts um, where there's disorder, where there's extreme poverty, where there's um, where there is violent extremism, is that those are countries that do not respect the rights of women, that do not give women and girls equal opportunities. And, and you see that the countries that are doing the best in the world, that have the highest economic performance, that are the most peaceful, most stable, most prosperous countries, are those that do empower women and girls and give them equal opportunities in their societies. So the fact that this is it's a fairly obvious, you know, banal observation to say all of this. I'm not, I'm not breaking any ground with this. Yet it hasn't infiltrated into the way that we do foreign policy and national security policy. It's been 20 years since the United Nations passed the UN um, Peace and Sec the Women, Peace and Security Resolution, uh, Resolution uh, 1325 at the Security Council, which was intended to get policymakers working on conflict resolution, working on conflict prevention, working on, on these serious issues around conflict and instability to recognize the centrality of this very banal observation that I just made um, and, and incorporate that into peacemaking, peace building, conflict prevention and negotiation, peace negotiations. And the progress has been pretty dismal, I have to say. And Afghanistan is a great example of how we have the tools, we have the, the empirical information about what works with peacemaking, that inclusive peace processes where women are given a full seat at the table, are fully empowered to participate, the concerns of women and girls are taken seriously at the peace table, that those things lead to more durable peace agreements, they lead to a more successful peace, um, they lead to lower levels of violence and, and better economic performance coming out of conflict. All of that has been empirically shown. And yet, what did we do in Afghanistan? Not that. Um, emphatically, not that, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, the women who were participating in the Afghan, um, intra-Afghan, first of all, in the negotiations between the United States and the Taliban, women's issues were rarely, if ever, brought up, I can tell you, because I fought with my colleagues in the administration about this constantly. It was a constant source of frustration and, um, and just constantly fighting with colleagues in the administration about it and pointing out over and over again what a mistake this was and how it undermined the very um, aspirations that they had put out in terms of what they said they wanted to do to build a durable peace and to make it so that the United States would not have to come back to Afghanistan with military force. Um, but they, you know, again, we continue to use the same old tools that have failed time and again in the past to address this solution and, if, and to address this problem and expected different results, which I believe is one of those um, classic definitions of insanity to keep trying the same thing and expecting different results. Um, but that's basically what we did with Afghanistan. Um, and then when, when the intra-Afghan negotiations began, and the women who were brought to participate um, on the Afghan side were incredibly brave. They were incredibly, they were incredible women. They are incredible women. I know several of them very well. I'm friends with them. They fought really hard and they were, they had a very strong voice and had pretty strong support from their male counterparts in the negotiations team. But by the time that they were brought into the process, the damage was done. And because there was nothing, you know, they were not, the, the die was cast in many ways at that point, and it was too late for them to materially affect the outcome. I think also that, so I think that we can see, we, we know that we need to do things differently when it comes to resolving conflicts, to, when it comes to dealing with, with situations like this. We know that we need to put 
Um, we have a Women, Peace and Security Toolkit. We have all sorts of um, capabilities that have been developed over the past 20 years, but they aren't being deployed systematically. They aren't being deployed effectively. To this day, if you look, uh, you know, Antonio Gutierrez, who's the Secretary General of the United Nations, has, has styled himself as a gender champion. He talks a lot about bringing gender balance to senior levels of the UN, but one place where there is not a lot of gender balance, in fact, there right now, last time I checked, there were no women charged with negotiating um, with any of, in any of the conflict areas that he, where he has appointed a special representative or a special envoy. Um, the only woman who's been appointed as a special representative of the Secretary General has been in the Myanmar case. And in, in both in that case, she's not been given the support that, that she would need to, to really impact that situation. Well, when you mentioned the UN, just not to interrupt you, back yes. in April, the UN handed Iran, one of the biggest violators of yes. women's rights, a seat on their commission on the status of women. Actually, they won that seat. And you well, know, this, they, yeah, this so is this a secret. First of all, they were asked to comment. They said no comment. <laughs> and they said that the voting was in secret. Yes. What happened to transparency? Isn't the United Nations a global organization? Yes, but secret so, ballots still well, take place. But you know, that means that whoever voted for Iran to get that seat obviously did not want anybody to be privy to that. You tell me why. Well, almost all of the voting at the UN is done by secret ballot. And this is right. a, a fact of the way the UN operates for all of its um, claims to transparency and claims to support women and girls. Most of it, uh, most of what happens at the UN is done through backroom deals and, and a lot of shady well, vote trading. You know, obviously what we all know the reality of the situation right now, what can we do? Because we don't wanna keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So what can different sectors do in order to raise the cost of such behaviors? Why? Because if we don't, then this behavior obviously, well, you don't wanna be an enabler, right? right? And you wanna be able to hold certain people accountable for their trespasses. So what, how can different sectors from private sector to political sectors, to women and human rights organizations, even to organizations like the UN, who, who, you know, under their brand banner have UN women, for example. Mm -hmm. And I work with UN women and I know you've worked with the UN. Yes. So it's not to say that UN in its entirety is flawed, but there are significant flaws. What can we do in terms of the global community and different sectors moving forward so that these mistakes are not made over and over again? Because really you cannot let humanitarian issues take a back seat. At the end of the day, like you said, when you hold back half the population, you're really holding back the entire global community. Well, I think that organizations like Girl Up that are working around the world to create a generation of women and girls who won't take these things lying down, um, empowering the women and girls in, in um, places like Afghanistan, giving them the tools and the opportunities to speak and having these audiences and these platforms are really critical because that is part of the accountability process. It is not perfect and we don't have great tools right now. Um, it, it, it's very hard to punish people who don't care about their populations and are willing to commit atrocities against them. You know, if they're if they are willing to to harm their own people, they don't really care very a, much about yeah, our. There's a difference between yeah. engaging with them yes. as well, right? right? And entering into deals with them. And, Correct. You know, my concern is what Zarifa said, which is please don't give recognition to them. And I wanted to go back to Zarifa if we can bring her in, please. Um, Zarifa. Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Zarifa. I wanted to um, bring up your tremendous courage because for, I am really in awe of you and everything that you have done, not only to date for your country, uh, you're an exemplary woman and what you have done since, you know, just the last few months, first of all, congratulations, you were just the recipient of the Oxy Courage Award. You're also the recipient of countless other Courage Awards. My heartfelt congratulations to you. Zarifa, you have made a very powerful comment which struck out to me recently. You have said that you would be willing to sit and talk to the Taliban if the opportunity came about. Because you have said, 
quote, we need to understand each other. Foreign forces are not coming to help us. It's time to resolve the issues with the Taliban, and I am ready to take that challenge. Now, before you begin, I wanted to say that is very bold. Um, and also, uh, given that you have also said the Taliban do not know how to govern, all they know is how to kill people. You've also said you don't trust the Taliban, especially when it comes to women's rights. Let us remind everybody here today that when the Taliban were last in power, they undertook draconian measures such as public flogging, stonings, and executions. Now, what has become apparent in recent months is the Taliban rule is obviously playing out differently across the nation. There have been some Taliban leaders who've said they will be exercising moderation when it comes to women. The details on that are still vague. There have also been Taliban leaders who have said that women will have rights and be active in society, but within the framework of Islam. Again, details on that are vague and yet to be defined. Do you trust the Taliban uh, overall, given this moderate versus hardliner stance, which as a woman from Iran, I've seen Iran playing this game as well, which after 40 years, people in Iran are you know, in a worse condition. Do you trust them to come to some kind of a resolve if the opportunity presented itself a middle ground or do you feel that in essence, this is a losing game? Uh, thank you, Naina. Actually, when it comes to a person, to a daughter, to a girl, uh, it's so hard to me to trust them, to sit to them, to talk to them and to accept them at least being in the same room with me because they are the killer of my dad. They are the murderer of my dad. They tried too many times to kill me. They are the responsible ones uh, and somehow shared by some of uh, uh, other allies of Afghanistan uh, to take more than 26 years of struggles of me away from me, my life away from me, my family's life. And like uh, being an immigrant was never a choice for me and my family, but yeah, we are right now. So all coming all together, bringing all this together, it's so hard, it's so painful, but why it's important for us to sit and talk to them. It's about, I think they need to, know the realities of Afghanistan so perfectly. And, they, and this was the biggest problem and the biggest topic for me, especially during the peace negotiation with the Taliban that I raised it too many times with too many different platforms. And through that, that Taliban need to know the new realities of Afghanistan through the new generation of Afghanistan, through the new faces of Afghanistan. But like, unfortunately, it never happened. And no one like heard really what exactly we want, the woman, the new generation of Afghanistan. And then after all, when it comes to trust them, it's about, you know, uh, first of all, right now, their statements, their words, the media uh, conferences and, and statements never thought, speaks their action. What we see, what we hear from around the country, it's uh, beating up people, killing people, betraying people, uh, kind of a big amount, a huge amount of target killing of previous government workers are happening in Afghanistan a huge amount of women, uh, you know, uh, killing. They are killing women around. They are kidnapping women around. Uh, they are, uh, so at the same time with this stunning, with the, what they were happen doing it in previous time of the government before 2001, they were suing people, killing people in public, hanging their bodies in public. The same they were doing it right now. And I, I, I really don't know, um, I'm really sorry to touch this, but yeah, I really don't know and I'm really confused that when we, the negotiation started, 
U.S. representative Khalilzad was the one who said that Taliban has changed. And I don't know what he saw change about them. I really don't know, and I can't find it out, that what was changed something for them. Maybe uh, the only thing that is now changed is just, you know, they themselves can live uh, in luxury lives, the, the leaders are able a little bit to speak in English and to, to speak in front of media and somehow. If this is the change and this was the reason to put all the country to their hands, I think it's, it was the biggest mistake. And the same is right now. Definitely, I can't trust them with the situation that they are going through it right now. But yeah, uh, if we can definitely and we can surely make pressures and bring pressures on them on their responses around the, the especially Pakistan intelligence and Pakistani government I'm definitely sure uh, and it's importantly to break the ties of Pakistan and Pakistani intelligence with the Taliban and not giving Taliban another platform like with any other uh, title right now they have been requested a uh, UN for a seat so and it's a huge top discussion and hot discussion and uh, I was just thinking about sending a letter to UN headquarters and asking them uh, on behalf of women of Afghanistan to not do this it, like I'm so whatever is happening around it's a kind of giving them platform the same platform that US a Taliban deal give them in, in, in 2020. So the same platform, if we are giving them back, it's a huge mistake. The only, the only option is to pressurize them, to break Pakistan's size, to not support them in the ways that they are nowadays asking for. So they can, you know, they can exactly uh, come to an end and speak to the pupil and sit and and then uh, uh, think of the future because whatever now is happening in Afghanistan it's like so huge mess uh, and for that I think it's it's so important to uh, do, do this concrete steps and when uh, uh, for the last um, I'm, I'm definitely sure when we can break the ties of Pakistani intelligence in Pakistan with the Taliban and at the same time not giving them a platform the same uh, as U.S. Taliban deal give them in 2020. I'm definitely sure <coughs> they are also human. They are speaking the same language that I do. Dealing with them is so easy because I'm not like I'm not afraid of them while they did too much to me. So when I am not, there are too many people in Afghanistan, they're not afraid of them. Whatever is happening is just this intelligent, stupid game. When we can stop that, uh, solving issues with the Taliban and their soldiers is so easy. Robert, Kelly, this is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Meaning on the one hand, we don't wanna give them recognition. We don't wanna do anything to enable them to give them legitimacy. Right. And on the other hand, you're dealing with a uh, militant power that, as Zarifa has rightfully pointed out, doesn't know the first thing about governance. So we can sit at the negotiation table with them. We can try to reason with them. Zarifa can, has courageously volunteered to even talk to them. But do you realistically think it's possible to get anywhere with them? Ideologically, from even an ideological perspective, do you even, you know, Mahbuba Siraj, um, prominent um, Afghan journalist and who was actually living in exile for a quarter of a century before returning to Afghanistan in 2003 to help start a women's movement, has uh, said that she refuses to leave Afghanistan, that she's going to try uh, she hopes to be able to continue her work, and she hopes that the Taliban will realize that the Afghanistan of today is not the same Afghanistan it, it was 20 years ago. Do you feel, uh, although I'm always work, err on the side of hope myself, uh, do you think that that is a realistic way of approaching the Taliban and the hope 
that they recognize the hope that they see that women uh, are not part of the destruction, but part of the construction of Afghanistan? Uh, actually, Nina, when, when it's about like, you know, uh, uh, coming to this point, it's like, okay, if I stop at least thinking of this or keeping this hope in my mind and my heart, then what other way people are able to suggest or to uh, to give me to feel at least uh, alive and hopeful with? Definitely, there is no way out. Like there is no other chance and other way. It's the only possible way to take this responsibility ours by our own shoulders, uh, because. Whenever international community and all the decision makers in the topic of Afghanistan puts Afghan people aside of decision making, aside of the policy makings, aside of topics and discussion, it things are getting ruined. The same is happening in Afghanistan. We were asking and we were yelling, we were shouting, we were like being able one to please and please let us to lead this discussion with the Taliban and the negotiation. But it was, it was always, you know, but before any kind of deal with Afghan government and people, US administration signed a deal with the Taliban that not only give them a platform that they use it the, the worst way, but it, was kind of, I feel kind of being sold out to the enemies of my country. I feel kind of sold out to the murderers and killers of my dad and it really kills me and it really pains. So when it comes to this, it's, it's always like, you know, the only thing for now that the only option and the only request that we are putting it to the international community is to pressurize Pakistan and their intelligence to cut their ties. Because whenever it comes to the reality of whatever happened in Afghanistan or whatever happening in Afghanistan, it's always Pakistan designing, running, and benefiting the whatever's like uh, happening around the, the, the country and the region. And at the end, the one who pays prices of one people and of one nation. Let's come to the 2001 attacks in New York City. The attack designer was Osama bin Laden and he was in a very safe shelter in a better part of Pakistan next to a big military base. But US analyzed, they started, they came to Afghanistan and they started bombing everyone, everyone and interviewed kind of, and they said like, we are here to uh, destroy Al Qaeda or break the ties or whatever. But after two years, like, and most importantly, they came to Afghanistan to kill Osama bin Laden. But after two years, we got that Osama bin Laden was in Pakistan. There is like questions with the reaction. If they knew that Osama bin Laden is in Pakistan, then why they started, did they came to Afghanistan? Why they didn't go to Pakistan and they didn't bomb there? And if they were not aware that where is Osama bin Laden, then why sell this, they did this to Afghanistan? But whatever happened at the end, the chapter, at least after 2014, after 2016, everyone had a clear, picture of whatever is happening in Afghanistan. But no one stepped concretely. No one said anything to a special sponsor of these tourist groups. There are still training centers of tourist activities in Pakistan functioning there. They are still, they are still sponsoring Pakistan and their military. They are still sponsoring feeding this stupid war in my country. And the world knows it. But still they are quiet, but still no one says anything. Sometimes it shocks me. Sometimes it literally shocks me that how a handmade country like Pakistan, which was made by British Empire, it was not literally a country, can be this much, you know, something that no one sees to them anything. No one is able to tell them that, man, stop whatever you're doing. 
And this, the way that their prime minister and foreign minister is lobbying for Taliban, no one says them that, man, who are you to lobby for Taliban instead of Afghan people? Why you are like acting as a spokesperson to Taliban? It's something, it's all the topics that mix stuff to, uh, and mix me always to think the only one, you know, uh, solution. And it's help, stepping up as a nation, the stepping up of Afghan people themselves to solve this problem. Because when we put this problem to the shoulder of international community, then there's now today Afghanistan. We saw how we have been treated. The, the friendship of, I, I, yeah, definitely the friendship with the international community had their good parts and their good sides, but it was, it was something that we paid a big price for it, a big, big price. Do you do anyone know that just within defense ministry, we had more than 40,000 recorded murder soldiers, near about 30,000 disabled soldiers, near about uh, 10 to 15,000 uh, prisoners of war? Still, we had this. And the same, like, you know, the, the losses of civilians that been millions and millions in Afghanistan. And whatever is happening like this, it's something that uh, always, you know, uh, makes me to think of uh, definitely, it's just us because in, 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 uh, in uh, Afghanistan, in Persian, in Persian language, in Dari, we have a, a kind of phrase something that, when you were last baton of like you know short going to be uh you know disconnected it's yourself to connect it back it's only yourself who can do that if anybody else is helping it's not going to do it in the same way that is needed so now afghanistan became the last baton of my shirt and it's us to build it so it's the only way that I can, I believe, and I understand. And the only thing that I request for international community to do it is just pressurize Pakistan and their government, their prime minister, their foreign minister to at least not, please and please not, not act as a spokesperson for Taliban to international community and not lobby for their recognition on behalf of my people. We only have two. Okay, so the first question, this is Zarifa audience questions that have been written down. Zarifa and Kelly, any, both of you can please jump in. Uh, audience member, what are some of the specifics that US negotiations with the Taliban failed to address? Um, like to well, I, I can certainly start and I'm, I'm sure Zarifa has thoughts on this as well. Again, I think that the purpose of US negotiations with the Taliban, well, first of all, they took place out of order, right? We should not have been negotiating with the Taliban until after the negotiations between the Taliban and the, the Afghan authorities were done, or they shouldn't have been separated and put on separate tracks. And the United States certainly should not have intentionally excluded the Afghan government and the Afghan people from those negotiations. There, you know, in my view, the idea that the U.S. was negotiating with the Taliban directly without consultation with either the Afghan government um, or even our allies in NATO, which is, is what was happening, it is so that the whole construct was was flawed from the beginning. And the, the, what happened is the natural outcome of having a deeply flawed arrangement from the get-go. Um, and, and the whole plan was essentially negotiating the terms of surrender, not really negotiating a political arrangement or negotiating a peace process or any of those things. All of those were to, they were, you know, side concerns if they were even really, you know, they were, they were not really at the center of the process. And I think that was the fundamental problem. Zarifa? Uh, yeah, thank you, Kelly. I will, I will definitely join her uh, words. And uh, uh, yeah, this process from the beginning was uh, not going the way that it needed to go. It was a mess from the starting. 
for them is from the, the starting of this process. And secondly, what was important, at least for U.S., if they were, you know, they were uh, planning of withdraw and they were like announcing this withdrawal or whatever, they had to do it at least responsible wise. At least they had to do it with this agreement that they, they, they uh, signed with Taliban. They kind of, you know, just sold us out and that's it. And at the end of the chapter, they said, okay, John, I did my part, now it's your turn. You know, mm -hmm. like, so the most important thing was not taking care of humanity, humans of this country, for like bringing this topic of money, 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 and money again and again to the, to the top of discussion before then any topic of humanitarian issues. That was the big, big, mass and uh, this negotiation from that is starting. Uh, Ambassador Kelly knows my uh, my all idea about this because we have been talking on this topic too many times when I was in this fourth uh, March uh, and at the State Department 2020 for receiving Women of Courage Award. And we had so good discussion about this as well. And I shared everything. So I really never was not trusting this from that beginning. And I knew it is a mess and it will happen. So yeah, the result is now like this. Uh, so definitely it was a mess. Uh, we have one question for Zarifa from the audience. Zarifa, do you fear for your um, personal safety in Germany even long-term? For for just like overall uh, coming abroad, uh, uh, there are, uh, I'm so happy that Ambassador Kelly and then you are both here and uh, you both know that my biggest concern was my family's safety, not mine. It was my family to give them a safe shelter, not myself. So yeah. For me, it was never a decision to come out uh, because uh, as I said, uh, I really wanted to face whatever is happening. And it's still, I have the same idea on my mind, but about the CFC, uh, yeah, uh, it's so hard, especially when I have this idea and I'm always talking against ISI, Pakistan, and against all the intelligence games. So it's a little bit hard. It's, it's uh, uh, worrying a little bit, but uh, I'm not afraid of it because I believe uh, like for life on that, you live, you, you get bored to just die one day and uh, but everyone would die well everyone will die one day but it's always you know something that if you live for a cause and if you die for a cause it will always matters and it will always make you being part of their history and the memories of people so for me it's just that but uh, yeah uh, i don't know what to say more but yeah i just I just want to live for more, not to die this soon. So hope so, hope I could be safe. Uh, the only thing that I can say, because right now I'm just living in a normal house without any security, without any stuff around me. But, um, but yeah, uh, one of the most important thing that uh, and nowadays, uh, I enjoy it the most walking all the way to many streets around the city, enjoying at least a little bit of my mind, like my time walking around the city, seeing everything, nice and everything around. So yeah, that is, that's what is life for me right now here. So I don't know what, what to say anymore about my security. It's, it, it is wonderful to actually see Zarifa be able to walk or take a walk down the street because that's something she wasn't able to do in Afghanistan because the Taliban and other extremist groups had tried to assassinate her multiple times. And I remember talking to her after the last attempt on her life. And the amazing thing about Zarifa, which I think comes through in this today is that, you know, 
she she was never afraid and when these things would happen and when they would try to to you know they would attack her um and and she would get angry and not scared and that was <laughs> that's who Zarifa is and she's really quite remarkable um but I will say that the only time I have ever heard her frightened was during the evacuation time period when she was very worried for her family and not for herself ever but for her family and um and and the the need to get them out to safety was was her only concern at that time but I'm so proud of everything that she's done and I know she's going to continue to be an important voice for Afghan women going forward and make sure that we don't forget what's happened to them. I thank Rifa, thank you so much. Your fearlessness, the fact that you can have a sense of humor even about the death. We uh, curated uh, the questions, which I'm, I'm afraid we didn't get too many of, but you should know that Nina has a stack. Uh, <laughs> so you've inspired a lot of discussion and we left out the hate speech, which uh, came in online, which tells everybody what uh, a serious um, life or death matter this is and, and what a project it is to, to continue the humanitarian effort that all of these women are about. So um, in addition to that, Zarifa, you've had Zooms globally for weeks at a, a very traumatic time. And I appreciate your making time for the World Affairs Councils of America. 